Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Feel the 68 till I die. I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph children. DJ Khaled, you know the big DJ Khaled guy? Hands grow up in here. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Tasker. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. They have no swag. They have no nothing. Terrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Feel the 68. After that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to State Farm Stadium here in Glendale, Arizona. We are live from the Final Four where we got the game that we all wanted. Purdue, UConn, Donovan Klingon, Zach Eady, one team trying to go back-to-back, one team trying to be the second team ever to lose to a 16 and then win a national title the next season. We have all the storylines. My name is Rob Dosser. I have John Henson. I have Randolph Childress. I have Jeff Goodman who finally was able to actually get us to the – the arena to get us to the stadium Come after on. an hour and a half of trying to find a place to park. You know, long, long, you know, you know, you know, don't you? You, you know, guys, it's, it's all about the next play. You can't be a good team if you focus on the pass. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> let's talk about the game. All right, let's Jesus let's get Christ. into it. Thanks. Purdue, like eight hours ago. <laughs> Purdue 63, NC State 50, UConn 86, Alabama 72. Jeff Goodman, what is your biggest takeaway? from these two Final Four games? I mean, we got two pretty good games. Like, that was the the good thing about tonight because we were scared it was going to be ugly. And the first one, to me, the score wasn't quite indicative of the game. Like, I'm not saying NC State was going to beat them and anybody thought they were going to beat them, but they kept it close enough. And then the last one was really, really good. Shot making, good defense. Alabama shoots the hell out of the ball. It's 56-56. And then UConn responds with that huge 8-0 run, and they pull away. So I think tonight couldn't have gone any better. I, I agree. Um, it was a it was a fun game. Even though the scores weren't necessarily indicative of how close the games were, like I, I think both teams played. Nobody had a letdown. NC State played well. Horn played out of his mind. Burns impressed me with some of the times he scored on Edie, um, and then UConn. Every time you feel like they're on the ropes, like you look up again and they're up 10 points. So uh, it was a fun game. It was a fun day. It'll be a big what if for NC State. It'll be DJ Burns. I, uh, you, all, you always say to big guys, you got to protect your first foul. His first foul literally minutes into the game was a bad foul. His first and third fouls were horrible, and, and, and it hurt them tonight. He'll, 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 he'll have some sleepless nights over that. Hell of an effort, heavily, hell of a year for those guys. Really competitive game, I thought. Uh, but we got the matchup we wanted. In Alabama, I know we'll dive deeper into that. We talked about how many threes they needed to make. Eight of 11 first half, but only three of 12 the second half. And I thought that was, you know, they cooled off from behind the three-point line, and I think ultimately that's what cost them the game. Yeah. But let's start with that, the, the UConn-Alabama game, because I thought that Alabama put together as good of a game plan as you're going to find for, for a team trying to – uh, to scheme UConn, trying to find a way to, to, to beat them. They didn't guard Steph Castle. They just sagged off of him. They put two guys on Donovan Klingon. They top-locked Cam Spencer and Alex Caravan. They said, we're not going to let you guys get going. We're not going to let you guys get a good uh, look at the rim. Tristan Newton struggled early, and they hit all of their threes. Alabama hit all of their threes. So, Jeff, well, I, I guess my big question is, UConn had going up against Alabama, one of the best offenses in college basketball, right? They, they shoot as well as they did. They game plan as well as they did. They play as well as they did, and they still won by 14 points. Yeah, and I thought one of the things that, to me, Alabama had to do, obviously we know what they had to make shots, but but they had to kind of hold their own on the glass, yeah. and they did, that. they did that. They did that. They did everything that if Nate Oates had said, hey, check this, check that box, check that one, they did everything. They're still down at half, <laughs> and then, like you said, they went cold in the second half from three. But, man, like that was a hell of an effort from Great. Alabama, a hell of an effort. I mean – just to be there again at 56 all and at the end I actually thought Alex Caravan and we'll hear from later in the big show shots. big shots and big defense he was he, he was so great. he was so good he made all of the little plays yes. he had I think two blocks on Mark Sears he got a couple defensive rebounds he had the offensive rebound of the putback that put him up eight he did he made a lot of winning plays they made Stephen Castle they, this game plan was make Stephen Castle beat us and he did yeah he he he, yeah. he to he to me. We talked about it. You and I were talking about this today. Yes. What would be the number one college guy that we would draft 
He's in and, the discussion. And he's in the discussion. I'm not saying I take him. No, no, no. You take him, but like he's in the discussion. Right? I think he he legitimately solidified himself as Why? a. Why? Why? Because you start out the first game and then you miss the first shot, and you see that psychologically with a lot of guys, a lot older than him, that messes with you. Never missed a beat, never changed his aggressiveness. He defends his ass off, and then he stepped up and still knocks down a couple of threes. That was opening up enough to still get in the paint. And, was the, you know, the, I think he was their best all-around player today. He was. Big-time Euro step move. Oh, he was great. Basket. He was like, great. He did everything tonight. He really did everything. Now, the one thing I actually don't think he's been able to showcase, and, and you've seen him. I've seen him in practice. I actually think he can play some point. Like, I think he's got good court vision. He can pass it as a secondary point guard, secondary ball handler. Doesn't really have that role on this team, but I think down the road he can do that. Yeah, Castle, you know, he was talking, he's like, you got to give up something. Yeah. And and they decided that Castle's going to be the guy. But even Alabama, I, when I watched them practice yesterday, I got laughed at, but I said <laughs> they look good. good. Like, yeah. they, they, they convey a lot different in person. Just coming from a basketball background, when I saw them playing and shooting, I saw the size and athleticism, I'm like, I don't. I mean, you know, UConn won by 14 points, but it was a lot closer than that, and and I figured it would be like that. And you know, it took UConn a little bit of time to adjust to that style of play and what they had going on. And uh, you know, credit Alabama, they 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 hey, put up a hell of a fight. Henson, did you jump out of your seat when Grant Nelson uh, had that dunk? <laughs> did you jump out of your seat? Um, because that was one of the best dunks I've ever seen at a Final Four ever. Yeah, I mean, it's it's up there. I mean, I I was shocked that he. Made went it. at him. Yeah, it went at right. him like that. But um, it was definitely an all-time dunk, you know, throwing it in. Klingon said it wasn't a dunk. I don't know. Oh, that was, he was a dunk. Watching. Give me a ruling on that. Right. Give That's me a, a ruling dunk. on that. A big man would say that. Is he, there he, even a he question? He threw it in, and he – no, it's, it's, a, it's two points. So, whatever you want to call it, you call it. That's a dunk. I credit it for challenging him, though. It was a hell of a play. I, I, I don't – you know, it's I, – I just – Love the way this UConn team. We're gonna let Henson responds. make the determination. On his head, that's, on his, that's a dunk. Give me that. It's a dunk. The big man would say. <laughs> that's a dunk. Exactly. The big man yeah. would say. I expect the big man to say. That. If you did, if you did that in your day, they said it well, was a dunk. If I did it on you your day, so, you'd be you yeah, you you be you know, so it's a dunk. Hey, R C was more like Braden Smith earlier yeah, yeah, tonight yeah, when he yeah, tried yeah. to dunk. Oh, that was yeah. brilliant. Braden Smith. <laughs> Braden Smith. Look, Braden Smith was trying to. We'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get to Braden Smith and his struggles later. We'll leave him alone. So, so with UConn, today. as they are moving forward, I, I think the thing that would worry me is that for, – for Purdue, the thing that would worry me is that we saw the NBA players, the, the best prospects on this team, the Steph Castle and the Donovan Klingon, were probably the two best players, I think, for UConn tonight, right? And then Tristan Newton, he finished with 12-9. and nine. I don't think he really played all that well. He had a couple shots late. He had a couple assists late. He was bad early on. I don't think we got the best um, – the best out of all of their guys. Like this, I don't think this was a peak UConn performance, Randall. The game plan is going to be, we talked about this, it's going to be, we talked about top blocking in, in, in Caravan. And, and, and for, for, the people, for the people at home, top blocking basically means that someone's trying to run off a screen. You stand above you, them. You stay above you them. They can't them. come off. There's so yeah. much to the pin downs. They were basically saying, we're not guarding Klingon outside. We're not guarding Stephen Castle. We're going to – I think at times they even did that to Newton. It's like, hey, we're going to mm -hmm. – you know, they were pressing those guys, and they were just like, hey, we're going to guard the other shooters. And that, it's essentially like a zone. It was almost like a triangle too. Not technically the triangle, but it was like we were sagging off. Like, hey, if we're going to give up threes to you guys, we're going to lose anyway. And credit UConn, they made enough. They made 10. They were 10 of 25. It's the best game that they had from behind a three-point line in the tournament. Mm -hmm. And they started slow. And they started really slow, which is why this game, and, and obviously I think them making threes is what opened it up. We knew they'd have an advantage inside with Klingon. It kind of gave him more room. And when Stephen Castle got going, it was just like, all right, we can't. He showed you, like, all right, you got to get out to him now. He's good, man. You, yeah, He's you got to get to him now. And, and when he knocked down a couple – I think it, it forced Alabama to make a little adjustment of what they were doing and opened it up for other guys. Castle's got like a – he moves different out there. His athleticism, is, he just looks different. And today, it just came out. Like, he's, he's a pro. And, and, they you know, he was in the lane, putting pressure on the defense. I mean, uh, I was impressed. He don't he doesn't settle to me. Yeah. I mean, he just – they played – they sagged off of him. He took a couple of threes. Even when he knocked them down, he didn't, he didn't settle from behind a three-point line. I thought he did a great job of just saying – I'm going to continue to attack the rim, put pressure on the rim, put pressure on you guys. And How about Alabama's guards, though? We're talking about UConn's guards. Like, Sears. Estrada was really yes, good. Was. Sears was really good, especially, to be honest, when he, when Castle wasn't on him, he really took advantage of them when Klingon 
when Klingon was out of the game, like I thought Alabama really took advantage when Samson Johnson was See, see, I disagree because the the 8 run, the, the 8 run yeah. where um, you come, where Alabama ties it at 56, yeah. they, they reel off eight in a row. That all of that was Samson. Well, Samson, had, I, I, yeah, he yeah. caught the he caught the lob on the offensive. It end. was a you lob. It was the it was the the roll where he had the screen. Yeah. Then yeah. he comes out of the other end and he gets a block, yeah. and then he gets an offensive rebound over here. Like the the dynamic of, and we talked about this a lot last year with with Edie and uh, with Sonogo and and Klingon, right? Is going from having a guy where you run everything through the low post, where he's hedging hard, where you're going to play a certain way on one end of the floor, and then you bring in a big man who does totally the totally opposite thing at a level that is almost at the same when, because when you're not scheming yes. it throws you off because you're not scheming you're scheming worried about clinging and then he comes in and then he gives them i think he's a better athlete who so gets up and down so if you notice he, he seems to always get a dunk some mm-hmm. type of rim running or some type of slip because of his athleticism and and they're not worried he, he about perfe- it. no they're not worried about it. And he perfectly compliments him and he gives them a little yeah. addition that that yeah. i think he moves a little bit better than clinging on the floor yeah. uh, we, we, we're gonna hear from alex caravan here in a second but um do you see him caravan as a fit in the nba this is a conversation i've had with a bunch of people i think like so there's his game isn't the sexiest game but he gets a lot of stuff done and he makes a lot of winning plays well the nba now is you pay your top two guys 100 Fifty million dollars a year, and then you have role players. And I think Caravan is a perfect complement. Don't know if he's like an every night starter, but six eight can defend a perimeter, can shoot the ball, get rebounds at a good Knows rate. Knows how to play. I, I think on a good organization, I, I think like you know how the Heat drafted, you know Jaime Hockey is not saying he's that type of player, but no, a certain like, organization could George def- Niang. A hundred percent. A certain right? organization like, could use could be him. That. And and probably. You know he'll 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 make some money. He, he's a good he's a good player. Yeah. All right. Let's get to that interview. Alex Caravan was joined by our Jeff Goodman. All right, Alex. You are one game away from repeating. I know you don't like the word, <laughs> but you're you're there now. You're one game away. Like, how does it sound? It's amazing. I mean, we've put in so much work, and um, you know, we weren't we weren't satisfied with what we did last year. I know the returners. We want to leave a legacy. We want to leave our mark on this historic program. So. You know, to be one win away, it's special. And, um, you know, we're just going to get ready right away. We're going to do recovery and get ready for Purdue because, I mean, they've been one of the best teams in the country the past two years, too. We've been waiting for this. I'm not going to lie. Like, Purdue, UConn, Klingon, Edie, the storylines repeat and kind of redemption. Like, this is kind of what the sport needed, I think. What, what do you think when you hear about all that? I mean, it's exciting, too. I mean, it's exciting as a player, too. I mean, you know, for us to add history, to go back to back on the men's side, and then, you know, their story, too. I know they're hungry, and they're hungrier than ever after what happened last year, too. So, I mean, they're one hell of a team. They have a great culture. They have a great coach and staff. Obviously, Zach Eady's been back to back National Player of the Year. So, I mean, it's, I think it's going to be the two best teams going at it, which is well deserving. You were great in the second half defensively which not a lot of people talk about your defense but it was terrific in the second half they put some great game pressure on you you hadn't faced it in a while they tied 56 then you guys went in that run how did it feel to have some finally some game pressure down the stretch I mean it felt good I feel like we needed it I think it was a good test for us but um really we've been having game pressure all season along especially in the Big East I mean those those teams were tough to compete against and um really it's just a credit to the Big East for prepping us we didn't get rattled we didn't we didn't go into this game expecting to win by 20 or 30 we knew it was going to be a grinded out game just with how talented Alabama was so um yeah we knew we just had to stay together and you know just have trust in our experience playing in against Edie what do you think I mean like I'm looking forward to this I mean the two best big men in the country how much fun is it going to be to see those guys and we got to let the refs let them play a little bit too right <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that but um I mean Klingon versus Edie I do think they're the two best big guys in the country and um I mean they're just both one of a kind players that you know college basketball hasn't seen so you know it's going to be exciting for people to watch all right South Bro Zone yes, sir. right yes, Alex sir. Caravan thanks man thank you The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines for making all of our picks and predictions, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use bonus code FIELD, and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money to get it. 
This is what you have to do to make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using that bonus code FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You'll get up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your bet loses. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, we have some fun stuff coming up for the rest of the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boost, and the thing that I love the most, a nice little parlay boost, as well as a ridiculous array of prop bets for anything that you could possibly imagine betting on. From odds on getting to the Final Four to National Championship futures, I'm calling it right now. Bet MGM is the king of the prop bet. So go download the Bet MGM app. Use that code FIELD and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the Field of 68 content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod in any podcast app. Like and share the YouTube videos that you enjoy. Tell your friends about us. It all helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Field of 68 After Dark from State Farm Stadium. Rob Doster has transitioned from the hosting chair to the analyst chair. And Jeff Goodman's here, Randolph Childress is here, and we are here because earlier tonight uh, we booked what is going to be a dream national championship game on Monday. Let's get to the Purdue Boilermakers. Purdue, this game felt like it was stuck in neutral for a while, gentlemen, because Purdue just had an arm's length distance and – it never really got all that dramatic. The Boilers are heading to the national title game. Your biggest takeaway. It, it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. It, it played out. It's very rare that we sit there and we spend like a day talking about what a game is going to be like, and then it ends up being exactly what we say that it's going to be. NC State couldn't get anything going because what they want to do is force you to make a decision with DJ Burns. He couldn't beat Zach Eady. They didn't double. They couldn't really get anything going offensively. DJ Horn got him going a little bit, but it wasn't enough. Then at the other end, NC State's guards, man, just climbed up in Purdue, forced him away from the basket, forced Braden Smith to play uh, one of the worst halves of basketball. I've seen a very, very high-level point guard just play halves. in a long time. It's the worst time. game he played all year. Yeah, he, that was – he he's an All-American-ish caliber player, and he looked like John Fanta. Was he was one rattled. Of the points for a yeah, while. he was rattled. He, was, he, he saw the – Whoa, whoa, my man Fanta does windmills. Don't do that. <laughs> Thank you, Randolph. <laughs> and uh, broke Touché. a St. Bernard at CYL record with 28 points in a game. <laughs> Continue. You know, I, you know, I'm sorry. I apologize. Well, it was just like quite it. a stray by you. Yeah, no. I'm trying to navigate a segment here. <laughs> You're right. I'm so, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. What did you? You seem to think when Rob said when Rob said it was exactly how we yeah, thought it was going to go. You don't think so. think so? Well, yes. The the game overall that maybe like NC State played close, but not. They frustrated Zach Eady. I mean, yeah. think about it. There was a long stretch where Zach we Eady thought didn't. They, we thought they would, though. Like we thought, really? Yes, we thought. Because what did we did. say? What did we did say? We? What did we say? That they're going to be able to force Purdue to push their offense out and run it from 40 feet away. Did you notice every time that De Braden Smith got a ball screen, he's getting the ball screen in the logo. He's yeah. not getting the ball screen at the three-point line. And then once that happens, it pushes everything out. Now Zach Eady is catching the ball 15 feet away from the basket instead of eight feet away from the basket. And as he's trying to back you down, this is what I thought they did really well. And tell me if this is crazy because you know this better than I do. When they would double him, they doubled as soon as he put the ball down. Yes. And my guess is because they're doing it from the strong side, they're saying that it's going to take him so long to dribble it because he's seven foot four bouncing it that we can they get can there and either it. make a yeah. steal or by the time that we get there, he's gonna we can get the rotation because you normally don't double the post from the yeah. strong side. He burned him a couple of times yeah. because he they, they came on the catch and he saw it and he sprayed it to the corner and they knocked down threes. Uh, I, I thought Gillis and, and the other guys, they, they no, just Gillis ready. made a huge he three. He made a huge three. Oh. They were ready. He, they punished him a couple of times coming on a double. Um, and I think the adjustment the state made was, again, they started coming when he started putting it on the floor. And it was a cat and mouse game, man. Ed was – sometimes he dribbled, he bounced it, he kicked it out. They threw it back in. I mean, it was just a hell of a game. But what we thought we were going to get from those guards, it was exactly what we said. I think the biggest difference is DJ Burns' foul trouble because yeah. he was – he more effective. Score. He was more effective scoring over Z. Sure. Uh, Zach Eady than I think people gave him credit for. I, I want to yeah. do that every time I say his name. I want to call him Zidi too. Like I, it, I think every it, single yeah, time yeah, I want to yeah, call yeah, him Zidi. <laughs> it just, it just, no, it just takes me a minute. Like when I say Zach, <laughs> I have to sit there and say Zach Eady because yeah. I want to say Zidi. I thought I thought Ben Middlebrooks was awesome for them defensively. Mm -hmm. Like that was the thing. Like mm -hmm. DJ Burns goes out and offensively, yeah, it's gonna hurt him. But I thought Middlebrooks was really good. He, I, he frustrated Edie in ball screen coverage. He kept getting back. You know, you know like, what's I wild? thought he did a really good job. You know what's wild about this? 
we're we're talking about him frustrating Zach Eaton, which is yeah. true. Yeah, he they, did. They, Zach Eaton did not play yeah. great. He finished with 20 points, 14 boards, right. four assists, two blocks, a nine for 14 shooting. Yeah, he becomes and the, he, that's the and, that's and, and game for him. We like, talked to him earlier. We're gonna we we're gonna here? play it, and he kind of gave it to me. Yes. When I said let's, that, let's that right he now. didn't play great. So yeah, we'll hear from Zach Eady right now because, you know, I said he didn't play great. But we're, did you join Zach Eady or did Zach Eady join? No, Zach you? <laughs> Zach Eady joined me. Okay, there we go. Zach Eady joined Jeff Goodman earlier tonight. <laughs> All right, Zach, probably not your best performance individually or team, but you advanced to the national title game, and your teammates were terrific today, right? They made those open shots where a year ago they didn't. How important was that tonight? Um, yeah, obviously I got to take care of the ball uh, better. You know, I had an off game, had 20 and 12, but I need to take care of the ball. Um, you know, they're, they're, they did some things. They kind of caused some, some havoc with their defense. They, they, they had a good game plan. Um, they kind of they missed some thing, uh, they mismatched some things and, and got me uncomfortable at some points. But I, I figured out for the end of the game and it was all working. But my teammates were huge all game, picking me up when I when I was struggling, making shots, like playing like they played great defense all game, great great defense. Um, they grinded it out when we weren't making those shots and we were turning it over. Uh, they felt like they were turning them over right back. Uh, so all credit to them and they 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 kept us in kept us in and allowed allowed me to kind of have that. Like that, that down that down the stretch run was, they, they kind of set that up all game by just playing hard and making shots. What's it like? I mean, a year ago, you think back to where you were mentally, and you're there. You're back. You have it. You're 40 minutes away from doing what you set your mind to do a year ago. Yes, yeah, the, these are the games you come back for. These are the games you work all year for. Um, these are the games you want to play in. Like this, this is the reason I came back to playing games like these and compete for championships. Um, like obviously, it, it, like we're, I don't know how to put this, but it's it's, it's a, it, it, just in short, it's, it's what you work for all year. In short, it's what you work for. Hopefully, we're all waiting for you to get you versus Klingon, UConn, Purdue. We've waited for this all season. What what would it be like to see you against Klingon, Purdue, UConn? Um, like we're we're gonna be. Uh, we're going to be ready for whoever comes out this game. Uh, we got, we've played against Alabama. Uh, we know how good they are. Um, we've watched UConn all year, obviously. We know how good they are. Um, we're going we're gonna to watch this game. We're going to lock in next year on whoever wins this game. Thanks, Zach. Great stuff there with Zach Eady and Jeff Goodman. Welcome back to State Farm Stadium after Purdue and UConn are on to the national championship game. Let's keep talking about the Boilermakers because I thought about this as NC State is scoring 50 points in an entire Final Four game. Two short years ago, when the season ended, Purdue in Ken Palm defensive efficiency was 93rd. Last year when the season ended, they were 24th. This year, they're 12th, and that number's going to go up after this performance. In what ways have you seen Matt Painter evolve? Well, I mean, listen, he's always been a hell of a defensive coach. That's one of the things Matt Painter's been known for, and they got away from it a couple years ago. And if you talk to him about it, he's not going to single out Jaden Ivey. But, but that was part of the problem, right? Jaden Ivey could score, and he could be an electric defender if he wanted to be. He could be a great defender. He just he didn't put his mind to it a, a, a lot of the time. So I, I think this team is, again, you've got Zach Eady, right? So you've got that guy that, you know, can patrol the paint. And he's not like a, a big-time shot blocker necessarily. But he's somebody that, again, everybody knows when they take it in there that he's going to alter it. He's big. Uh, he's strong. He's just kind of a different type of of, of rim protector. He, you know, again, he's just not gonna block a ton of shots. He doesn't try to. Like that's the thing. Rarely. He, like the, he's, he's come from behind. He's a lot of times that's what he can do he's fairly very, well. He's very deliberate in the shots that he tries to get. He's never because in foul I, trouble. Too. I think he really understands that that those two points don't matter as much as him being on the floor for forty minutes. RC. You've seen this NC State team a bunch throughout the season. Right. Why did they only score 50 points tonight? Because they have in half court, their point guard wasn't effective. He wasn't there. I mean, I, I can't stress enough how important for them DJ Burns is on the offensive end of the floor. And I think the lineup where this team has taken off is because now with with uh, Middlebrook or Diara aside him, those guys have been able to clean up the glass, do other things defensively. But he is the de facto point guard in the half court. 
DJ Horn did his part on the offensive end of the floor. Yeah. He needed the point guard to be on the floor, and he just wasn't there. They didn't have both of their point guards. Yes. They didn't have Michael O'Connell yeah. with a hamstring injury. Yeah. Oh. He was out, then he comes back in, and he can't move. And another I mean, thing we, we got well. to mention, too, is that even for Muhammad Diarra, it's Ramadan, and he's lost 12 pounds. Is that right? Yeah. Someone told me he's lost wow. 12 pounds. Not to mention he's, up at, four, he's up at 4 a.m. every morning right I now. I can't believe somebody can play that hard for that long, for not eating and drinking all day. Like, imagine. And no, and and that's what, and I thought when you saw him, I didn't think that he, he got pushed around a little bit early yeah. because of that. Yes. I, I think he was fatigued, and credit for him just to battle the way he did and what he's Amazing. been through. I, I think, again, it, it's it's just – I just wanted to say that about him because I think yeah. he's had a heck of a year, and it just says a lot about I, him. I think it puts him per- – to perspective of what Adama Sanogo did last year as the final four most outstanding mm-hmm. like he because he dealt with all that yes yeah. right it's not it's not easy Crazy. he was dominant with as the MVP yeah. and we're talking about yeah no doubt on the other side as Purdue advances here's the list all time of players who have posted at least 140 points and 70 rebounds in an NCAA tournament Elvin Hayes back in the yeah. 1960s yeah I watched him plenty Jerry Jerry West and Zach Eady so at this point, let me be the one to tell you that if you still are against the tree for the Purdue Boilermakers, you are a moron. I mean, seriously, you, you, are, you, you are a clown if you're still against what this guy is doing. And, that, and if you're going to be that way heading into Monday's national championship game, then you don't like fun. Because what we've got on Monday is the first time that two seven-footers are starting a national title game since Patrick Ewing and Hakeem Olajuwon 40 years ago. Yeah, the thing that I, I love about this matchup is that um, it, it's the storylines that we're getting out of this, oh, right? Oh, man. We have so the first many. back-to-back national player of the year since I don't even know when, right? Ralph have, Sampson. Ralph Sampson. Ralph Sampson. We have the first potential back-to-back uh, national title team since 2007. We have a team that is looking to be the most dominant team in the college basketball modern era. We also have a team that was the – the biggest chokers in all of college basketball coming up with a chance to be able to go from losing to a 16 seed to beating a one seed. And guys, this is a fact, something you might want to take to the bank, something we should have told John Henson before he left out of here. Do you know where the bank is? Yeah, I know where the bank is. I'll be <laughs> Could able to you get, get to the bank? I'll be able to get there if you, as long as you don't give me the directions. A team that lost to a 16 seed has never lost a game. In the next NCAA oh, tournament. Thanks. thanks. Wow, that yeah. was yeah. that was really, really riveting, uh, insightful news. Who was Facts. that sponsored by? Factual. <laughs> that rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, this you just said it, Jeff. Like, this is an incredible national championship yeah. game. It's what we've wanted all year. It's what we've wanted all year, and, and you don't always get it. No. And now it's here after again a national semifinal we were worried about. And you've got the two big boys. Right. And, and big boys being, you know, obviously Zach Eady and Klingon. So they haven't really gone up against anybody their size and their talent level all year. And you've got the two best teams and you've got two terrific coaches that are very, very different.
Whether you are a world-class athlete or a podcaster like myself, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. After a six-month season loaded with cross-country travel and late nights, I can promise you that proper recovery is a priority for me these days. That is why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Field of 68. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers that's powered by the Energy Enhancement System, or the EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in New Jersey or at hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Are you interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Well, all you got to do is go to unifiedhealing.com slash field to learn more and find a center near you. You can find that link in the description below. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash field. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before you undertake a new healthcare regimen, including the EE system. Welcome back to the Field of 68 After Dark from State Farm Stadium. In Glendale, Arizona, we have booked the dream title game, UConn and Purdue, Saturday. It will be just after 6 o'clock local time here in Arizona over on TBS. We'll have you covered pregame at BetMGM and postgame right from here. So before the break, I asked Randolph Childress what his most intriguing matchup is and what he would do. So I want to try to – here's the question. The question is – can UConn be beaten? And yes. I think we've all made the argument of why. Yes. What does Purdue need to do to find an advantage in the game, and where could the advantage come from? I, I don't. So I don't think either of these teams are going to. When you're the underdog, right? When you are an Alabama, I think you try to put together a scheme that is going to change what you do, tailor it to a specific team, and try to find a way to win that way. I don't think you do that if you are the favorite. I think you do what you do and you try to beat, you try to make them adjust to what you are. And I think both of these teams are going to come into this game saying we should be winning this. We the, we are the favorite. Of course, we are the national champion favorite. I don't know what the spread. Oh, wait a I don't, Hold I don't, on a second. Not Purdue's a, not the favorite. Not, the spread is six. Six. No, it is six point five. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, yeah. that's a lot. No, no, hold of on points. a minute. Yeah, there's not. Purdue's the underdog in this game. Six yes. and a half. But I don't think that they're going to come into this saying that we need to change what they do. I think, they're going to, I think they're going to do what they do. I think they're going to do what they do. So I'm talking about who, Rob? Purdue. I think they're going to do but what they, they do. They have to because they don't, they don't play any other way, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that's how they play, and, and they should. And they have the most dominant guy in college basketball, and he's going to play that way. Uh, they're not running their offense through clinging as much as Edie. Edie's going to touch it 75% of the time down the floor. Um how do you think that matchup works? Like, what do you, what, how do you envision that matchup? Because neither, neither guy needs, it's going to get help early. It depends on the They're officials. Play each other one on one. It, right, it is going to depend it, on it, the officials it, a lot. It doesn't appeal because Zach Eady doesn't foul. So it doesn't matter. He's going to do what he does. So, so. Can Kling and handle can, Edie defensively? Can Kling and score on Edie? No, is, not really. And I, not I, really. I think that's it. And he's not going to foul. So, again, for perimeter guys, if they're not shooting it well, if if UConn isn't shooting it well, I, I've said this all year, man. He he and NC State struggled inside. He he dictates the paint on both ends of the floor, and I and I think people, it throw out his, it's not his stats. It's it's now maybe they can clean up the glass and, and win, but I just think that it's going to be a lot closer than people think. And and I, no, I, I think I actually Zach agree. Eady wins the matchup production wise because that's what he does. The I, question I, I have is with the guard play, and, and they're still. Are they going to? Is this the beginning of them starting to knock down shots and start knocking down threes? Because this was the best three point shooting game that they had. And early on, it didn't look like that. They didn't yeah. come out the gate shooting the I, I think they will. I, there's there's three things. I've said this all year long. If you want to beat UConn, there's three things that you have to do. One, you got to get the big fellow in foul trouble. 
you got to find a way to get Donovan Klingon to the bench. And as good as Samson Johnson was tonight, if you can get Samson Johnson playing 20 minutes, that is a win for your basketball team. Two, you got to have an outlier three-point shooting night. You have you you got to do what Seton Hall did, go uh, or, or what Creighton did, go 15 for 29. You got to do what Kansas did, go nine for 14. But none you got to do what Rob, Alabama the, the did in the first though, half. The difference, Rob, is that none of them had Klingon. I mean, uh. uh Zach, I mean, Eden. well, no, no. So, and that's the way he plays. Yeah. He fouls your guys out. Well, so what I was going to say is that, um, and then you can't let them just kind of run their stuff. And there's two things that I think Purdue is going to be able to do that really matches up well with UConn. One, you got the best foul drawer in the history of the sport of college basketball. Right now. Yeah. Right. Donovan Klingon is going to have to be very, very disciplined in terms of not fouling, not jumping for pump fakes, not going with the two arms right there. If you give up some light, like he's going to get 20. You can't go into this thinking, I need to shut him out. You need to go into it thinking, I need to make him work for every point that he gets, and I can't get him, put him on the foul line, right? They're going to be very good at doing that, and I think Edie's presence is going to be enough to mess up what they want to run offensively because you don't have that outlet valve to throw it to Klingon in the post. They're going to – my guess is they pull Klingon away from the basket. They let him kind of be the guy that sets those screens. You get those zoom actions. You get those DHOs. You let them run off of Klingon. And the one thing he's done really well is start being able to pick out passes. Rob – excuse me, Jeff – you did report this. Uh, the sources told the field of 68, the national title game officials are Jeff Anderson, Roger Ayers, and Terry Oglesby. Yeah, three of the best. Not did Terrence, they let him play? Terry. I'm glad that at least one T.O. made it to the Final Four this year. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Uh, Jeff, what do you make of that crew? Really good. I mean, really good. We're going to get some high stepping, which is nice, right? Always good to see some high stepping. Um, Anderson and Hurley have some history. They, but they do have some the history. They, they buried been. it. They've been good all year. Uh, and he actually officiated their national semifinal game last year. So uh, I, I think it is going to be interesting to see if they let him play. And, again, I just want to see you're, – you're right. Like, Klingon's not really a big weapon offensively, but can, as Rob says on the defensive end, the wall, Great Wall of Bristol, mm -hmm. can he make life – how difficult can he make life for Zach Eady? Because Zach Eady's never seen anything like him. You don't think so? You don't think it's going to be hard for him? I – Breathing. I don't know how you bother a guy shot at seven five, that's shooting a hook. He's and, just and, never. And we're not, and but we, he's used to shooting over guys that are like six nine. I mean today, like Middlebrooks, right? How tall is Ben Middlebrooks? Just, well, look, the, <laughs> once once Zach Eady gets the ball where he needs to be, it's the the issue is not. If you want to stop Zach Eady, you have to make him catch it further away from the basket, or take away. The, the entry pass. Like, you have to shut off the water to him. Once he's got it, he's going to get his. You can't, I, don't like, think you, gonna I don't think you can do that, though, because it's not just them throwing it in the post. They're not just going to come down and throw it inside. They do it in different ways. So, mm -hmm. if, they, if that's not working and you push him off, then they come with their dribble handoffs, and then the big, you got the help. Yep. And then he rolls, and if they don't get the lob, then he gets the seal. They get the yeah. ball back and get the seal. So, he's going to get the ball. Yes. What is interesting is that UConn is that – there's nobody that compares to Zach Eady. There's no one. UConn does have the experience of Klingon meeting someone that's at his size, and ironically enough, that, that team beat them once and actually Kulkbrenner. beat them soundly in Ryan Kalkbrenner and Creighton. So that's interesting in this game. I think the other thing that's, that's of interest, if you turn this to the lead guards, Braden Smith tonight was bad. Yeah. He had a bad game, about as bad of a performance as he's had. Would expect that he's going to respond from that. I would think. But Tristan Newton has now had two games in a row where he has not been particularly good. Tonight he was three of nine from three. He was searching for a shot. How either one of those responds is going to be really interesting on Monday night. Yeah, I, I think that this matchup is going to be a little bit more beneficial for him because my, for who for for Tristan Newton because I, if you look at Purdue's guards where Tristan kind of thrives is being able to overpower but you no one realizes that like the, the dude's a legit six five like he he's big yeah. and he's going to be guarded by fletcher lawyer who looks like he doesn't even know where the weight room is on at the, the purdue university right uh, fletcher or, lawyer is a quality defender he's though. a good defender but the the issue is like tristan can overpower guys that aren't going to be as big and as physical the thing with mark spears is like you're not you're not overpowering him. He's low. He's compact. He's got leverage. You're not going to be able to just bully your way to the basket. He can do that against Braden Smith. I think he can do that against Fletcher Lawyer. Maybe not Lance Jones. I would expect Lance Jones to be on him. Yeah. On the flip side, I'm I'm worried about this matchup for for Braden Smith because I think the UConn's size and athleticism in their backcourt 
it, whether it's Hassan Diar on him or Steph Castle on him, it's going to be those two for most of the game. I, like, I think it's going to give him a lot of problems. I like what you said. I, I agree with you on what you said about uh, Stephon Castle and Lance Jones in terms of who's going to guard who and that Castle could be moved on to Smith. But to RC's point, who were the beneficiaries tonight based on different defensive assignments? Jeff, Alabama was daring yeah. Castle to shoot. He yeah. took that personally. Sure. And, and does Purdue win this game but tonight I, without I do Lance the same Jones? Thing, but I would I, listen to me. You do the same you, thing? You make him, yeah, you make him have to make shots. And if he makes a couple, then you go out and guard him. Here's the guy that we're not talking about. Here's the guy that we're not talking about that I think actually could be the X factor on Monday night, Mason Gillis. I actually think he could be the X factor because he's that kind of four who could step out. He can make shots. He shot it at a high, high clip this year. I don't think you're going to play Trey Kaufman Ren a whole lot. You, you may see him here and there, but the matchup to me for Mason Gillis, and again, if he can make those shots consistently, which he's done, He's a game changer. RC, do you double Edie if you're UConn? Why no. would you? You can't no. start. No. You, just, you I, let I him go one on one. I think you got to see it, but I do think you got to give help because I, I what we know is that he's fouled out. He gives you problems. He fouls your big guys out. I think Klingon is too valuable, and I do think you got to monitor that. If he picks up one, you saw that with State tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, DJ Burns gets one quick when they sub him out. So I think Hurley how, did that with Klingon. He, he got one quick, get, pulled Klingon him out of before the first foul. Then you got to come out. You got to sub him out. So so you got to monitor that. And I think that'll be that'll be big. They can they don't pressure as much. They UConn's a really good defensive team, but they don't pressure as much as NC State does. And I, and that's why I say I think it's a little bit different. They're physical in the half court, but I think if you allow the Purdue guards to get across half court and get into their stuff. I think they can be more effective than they were tonight. I, I've been—I said it before the game. I think they'll respond. I, I just think the reason we talk about the reason NC State is here is that those guards—they—they they crawl up in you, man. And, I, and and I'm not surprised. And you saw that today, and that was part of the reason why Smith struggled. You have two teams, not just Ken Palm one and two, but they're both—they both have top ten offense and top ten defense. It, this is. The heavyweight of all heavyweight matchups. And this is interesting. The spread for last year's national championship game was seven and a half. If wow. you all feel disrespectful here, it's disrespected for Purdue that it's six, six and a half. I don't get it. That that is why it. I, I assume that spread will come down. I don't think it's gonna end up at six and a half. I bet it end, ends up closer to five, five and a half. You think this will be close? I think a lot of people are gonna take the points. Yes, and I think I'd absolutely think it'll be close. UConn's won 11 straight NCAA tournament games by at least 13 points. Yeah, I, they're not going to win this one by double figures. There's no way. Yeah, there's I, no way. I don't. I don't think so either. I know why I'm that. I'm not line, even sure they're going to win it. I know why Never that. Never mind win it by double figures. I, I know why that line opened where it opened because because I understand how these lines are kind of developed. But I, I, there's no way that it closes it. Like you that, do. That wait is, a minute. You do. I, you can figure out pretty much what a line is just by Foster looking at the Ken Palm numbers. Set the line in case you didn't. Have, <laughs> they call them. You know, I have learned from yeah. you. You know how to set, how to set the lines. Mm -hmm. You know great fashion with the blue jacket tonight. Mm -hmm. Seriously, hair product. Mm -hmm. You also know law. Like you're a lawyer, you're a semi lawyer expert too. I am. You, we didn't have to get midwinter on. Do we need the Do we need the pro football doc on before the title? Yes, <laughs> we might. Need, well, I don't know. To break down Donovan Klingon's hand. Break down. David Board just tried to ask that question and. Didn't he didn't get much? Well, I, he's I, fine. he's fine. Yeah, I mean, he got fouled by Yusuf Samgari in practice. That's what happened. And he's and he's fine. He looked he, good today. He shook. He he, he dapped me up. Donovan Klingon dapped me up with his right hand. I was like, Am I gonna break your thumb if I do this? He's like, No, I'm fine. We're, we're, he's fine. Nobody daps you up. He, he's fine. All right. Well, we've we've got another segment here. Do we have another? We do? Yeah, we're on for another segment after the break. We're going to keep talking about this title game showdown. We'll take a ride on the coaching carousel again. We'll get some RC's takeaways tonight, and uh, Rob will have some, some thoughts, and we'll map quest his route home. That's right. That's right? right? If map quest is still around. That's all coming up here on Feel the 68 After Dark, live from State Farm Stadium, UConn and Purdue, baby. The dream matchup is happening. By now, you guys have surely heard about Autograph, an app founded by Tom Brady with the intention of disrupting the way that fans consume content covering their favorite teams. This is how the app works. All of the podcasters, bloggers, and digital creators covering a team have their content sent 
to that team's page in the autograph app. Instead of having to bounce from site to site or trying to navigate the safer workspaces on Twitter, you can just scroll through autograph. This isn't a hard sell. This is the truth. I am a UConn fan and I use the autograph app to keep up with the writers I read and the pods that I listen to about UConn basketball. The best part is that every piece of content that you consume gives you reward points. The more you get, the more chances you have at things like discounted tickets to games and the grand prize, a trip to the LA regional and a spot in a suite for the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games. Here's the best part. We've partnered with Autograph to donate $1 to the V Foundation every time someone downloads the app using the code F68 with a minimum of $2,500 getting donated. The app is free. So download, use the code F68, help us raise a little bit of money for cancer research and give Autograph a try. I promise you it will be worth it. And while we're here, a quick reminder, make sure that you subscribe to The Daily. We have new landing pages with deep dives into each coaching change, as well as a tracker that provides scouting reports on the transfers that have entered the portal that you are going to want to know about. Hit the link below to subscribe. Welcome back to the Field of 68 After Dark. It is our final segment of this Saturday Night Show. We're back with you tomorrow from 4 to 7 local time, 7 to 10 Eastern time, live from Huss Brewery, where I teased the uh, the carousel before the break. We'll take a ride on that tomorrow, Sunday, Sunday afternoon ride on that tomorrow. We're going to talk more about our national championship game showdown. And before the break, Rob was asking us the question of, you know, does Purdue have to win this game? But then we changed it as a crew, and we said, what does the game mean? So I'm going to have RC lead us off. What does the game mean? You, you've got an interesting twist on this one in terms of the history of hardware for each program. Uh, UConn has how many national championships, Rob? Five, right? One, two, three, four, five, yeah, five. And Purdue has how many, Rob? Uh, I believe zero, right? Right. They, that would be right. And, and so I, I think that you're here now, and I don't know if Purdue how many how often they will be here, right? How many more times you don't know? Matt Painter's it's like Jeff said, is on his way to a Hall of Fame career, and I think the opportunity to do something that's never been done there. I, I think UConn is. We said this a year ago. They're a blue blood. I think they'll be back. They're going to get the pros. They're going to get the recruits. That that doesn't happen all the time at Purdue. And I think now that you're here, there's a sense of everybody wants to win it, but I don't think anybody knows when the next time. I think we all, everyone would feel comfortable saying we feel like UConn could get back here in 10 years. Mm -hmm. We don't know if Purdue could. Does Purdue have to win the game? Yeah, listen, I'm not sure that Will Berg is the next Zach Eady. So I, I think they need to win. I think they need to win because they have Zach Eady. They yes. have the two-time national player the of the year. Player of the year. Yep. And that's that's the key, right? They, they may never have that again. They had it with Big Dog, right, years ago. I don't even know if these guys know who Big Dog is. Glenn Robinson. He's Glenn Robinson. You better know. I know his son. Played right. with Matt Painter. You do. You do. <laughs> but, but, again, they have the best player in the game. They have enough really good players around him. So this is an opportunity. I mean, they haven't been to the Final Four since 1980. John, how will we think about that? Like what he just said. Like, when is the next time? I, I There's been two times in my lifetime I can remember where I can say Purdue's had the best player in college basketball. And Big Dog Robinson was one. Yeah. And now Zach Eadie. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times you're going to be able to say that. I think what I would say is, is that it's not often – not, not, it's not often. It's not always that you see the team with the best player in the sport make it this far, too. Some well, teams have the best player in the sport, but don't aren't able to do also, that. So the other you, thing is, guys, we, we it, it's changed right now. Painter's always done it clean, okay? Painter's done it clean. Everybody in the sport knows that, right? Now it's a little different with NIL. If you have it at Purdue, can you sustain it? They've got really good NIL right now. Can they be at a level – where they can, and I'm not even sure Painter wants to be that guy who's shelling out money. It's, Look at what he did. He didn't go to the portal and, and spend a ton of money. He got one dude, yep. Lance Jones. He, he didn't difference. spend a million dollars or 500 grand for Lance Jones. He was a good piece. Tony Bennett does Development the right way. is still a big part of their program, right? right. It's still yes, a big retention. part of what they Retention and development. It's going to be harder and harder to be able to retain. Even at Purdue, even with Matt Painter, it's not going to stay this way. So, yes, I think there is some pressure on them. 
to try to you know win this whole thing right now because again I don't think they're six and a half point underdogs. I really I don't. That. I think it's a I think game. they can win this thing. I, I'll say this as a Cleveland sports fan native who suffered a lot of tragedy. Yes, yeah. you have. Well, thank you, I'm Randolph. Sorry. When we got to the finals, <laughs> when we were in LeBron Part Two in '16, it was like when Game Seven arrived on Father's Day. And you're saying, and I'm thinking to myself, my grandfather was still alive, my my dad was still alive. I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if this is ever going to happen again. Like that, you if you are, a, I I can get that side of it. Where if you're a Purdue fan walking in here on Monday night, you're thinking sure. to yourself, this is the once in a lifetime type thing. People have waited decades upon decades upon decades for this. Four years, yeah. forty four years, and more longer than that for a national title game. Purdue hasn't been to a national championship game since 1969. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I look, I and I understand all of that, and I think that all of that is correct. I also think that Purdue has done enough to prove themselves where they're they don't need this for their legacy. You know what I mean? Like you don't you don't need you don't need this to define the program as not being like the, the they're not the team that loses to mid majors anymore. They're not the team like I, the thing that bothers me the most about Gonzaga is that we look at Gonzaga and we say they've made it to two national title games. Mark Few's gotten to two national title games in, what was it, 2018 and 2021, right? Or 2017, 2021. And we look at him and we say, he can't get it done. He can't win the big one. He can't do this. He can't do that. He got to two national title games in five seasons in four tournaments at Gonzaga. He built Gonzaga into that program. So, like, my, my thing is that... They are here. They are on this stage. They've gotten to this point. They don't need to win this to legitimize themselves as whatever you want to call them, whatever whatever level you got to put them. Different level. I, yeah, I, I, I disagree. I, I think I agree. I agree. I disagree with you as well. Yeah, I, I think, think it's Painter because wins they, they, it. If Painter wins it, right? What is it? It puts him. It was like Lute Olson. Okay, I went to Arizona mm-hmm. when Lute Olson won in 1997. I talked to him about it. It put him in a different stratosphere as a coach. I think it, it can do games. that with. Yeah. But do, yeah. do, so, do you not think that Mark Few is on that level? No, no, I think he is on that level. But didn't my, you put my, him on your no, Mount no, no, Rushmore? No. The difference. Yeah. The di- uh, I don't know if I put him on. I don't you put him on your Mount Rushmore, no, and he's did. never won a I title. Did I did not. I did not do that. Actually, did. Don't Who did? be misquoting. Again. Someone, someone put him the, on a Mount Rushmore. The difference between it though is that let's go back to those teams and look at what they had on those teams, and that is the equivalent of what this Purdue it do team is. He hasn't had that now, and the argument is. Right. Talent-wise, this is still a sport where the cream rises to the top in talent. And say what you want about what Mark Few did in that time of that title, them national tournament runs, he had dudes. Yeah, dude. He had lottery picks. Jaylen he had Suggs, NBA players. He had, you know, he had those right. guys. Right. And that's why it was so important for them to get it done because now, is he a hell of a coach? He's proven that. But we didn't think this team was going to go to the national championship because it's not the same high-level NBA talent. And now you have that opportunity right now in Purdue. You have to win it right now. We know UConn's going to be back here. They're recruiting at a level where they're going to have NBA guys. They're going to have that going over. You don't think of that. Like, when's the next time Gonzaga's going to have that guy? When's well, the next time Purdue's going to have that guy? I'm not saying they good don't, next but year. they got the best. They're going to be good. Do they have the best guy? Where I, where I tweak your argument is I, I would say this. I would have more faith in Gonzaga under few getting back here because getting back to a Final Four, getting back to a national championship game, just because of what he's shown throughout his career. And when you make nine straight Sweet Sixteens, the ball could bounce a certain way. We, we do not know. I don't have the same level of faith for Purdue, guys. We don't know where when Purdue's going to be back here. Gonzaga could be back here. All these guys are years, great coaches, be? but this still, it's sure. still a Jimmy's sure and Joe's Gonzaga. game. It's still the same. It's still a Jimmy's and Joe's game. All these guys are great coaches, but damn it, when I got Zach Eady, life's a lot, hell of a lot easier. That's right. That's when right. I got Chet Holman or Jalen Suggs, a hell of a lot I got Drew Timmy. Yeah. It's a hell of a lot easier when I got those guys. Their talent, listen, when you put up Purdue's talent to, to UConn's, it's not that far off. No. It's not that far off. Is Purdue, I mean, is Purdue more talented than Purdue Indiana? Indiana? Make no <laughs> oh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I did. I Do you did look have, good in orange? <laughs> I look better in blue. <laughs> well, I'd like to. Have, you look good in what is that color tonight? I don't know what this is. Cream? Cream color? I don't know. I don't know what color this is. Cream. Cream. It's, a, it's not. Dagan Hughes says it's that's not cream. Not cream. No, what cream? color is right this? Gray? Sweeney Tristan, what color gray? is Goodman wearing? Gray. Gray. It's right, beige. I'm told it's gray. You look good in. There's no chance it's gray. 
Let's you keep it. Let's days. keep it. Let's keep it rolling. So, so let's get this. Let's get this train back on the tracks. Be, it's never been on the tracks. <laughs> um, so you seem to be inclined to bet Purdue to cover the spread on Monday night. I, I, right now, I don't. I don't think I'm going to do that. Are you going to put all your free bets? Oh, because you don't want to jinx your UConn Huskies. No, I just I want to be. <laughs> I don't want to. Absolutely, that's the case. That's no, no, no. It's is. not. It is. It's not. A, it's not a jinx thing. It's I want to be able to Go enjoy home. that win yeah. without having the sweat of like. Well, I'm going to okay, tell well, Dan Hurley tomorrow that you put it, your house on the <laughs> Purdue Boilermakers. <laughs> okay. Just so you know. Okay. RC, what would you bet Purdue? I would bet Purdue to cover. I would be, I think I think this will be a game uh, unless the backcourt of Purdue I mean of UConn dominates this game then I expect because I expect Edie to do Zach, hey, Zach our, our betting extraordinaire Sean Paul for the network he, he just said he put a ton of money a ton of money on Purdue is that true eleven dollars <laughs> And no, I, I think well, it was 13. All right, well. I think it was 13 bucks. Hey, a cheesy gordita crunch and a chalupa are in your future. <laughs> that bet cashes on, on Monday night. I, I just, so here's my thing as a, as a, we all are fans of this sport as much as we cover it as well. Like, I would love to see a close game. Oh, we want, we want an epic game. I think that's game. more what I'm hoping for. We want an epic game. That's why I really want Please. them to cover. I'm not saying, I, I don't even know if I'm ready to say who I think will win. We'll get into that tomorrow. I just hope it's a game where it is a one possession, two possession game. I mean, these have been. This is the two. I don't two see. Best I don't teams. see any way that it's not. Now, oh, I it, do. I, it might not end up anyway, being being I inside do. that number. I, 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 it might not end up being inside that number, but I think it's going to be the worst case scenario to me is going to be something similar to what we saw with with Alabama and UConn tonight, where it is a game that is exciting and you have shot making and it's close and it's in doubt in the second half and we don't know what's going to end up happening. I don't think that this is going to be. I, I don't. I just think Purdue is too good, and they the match. Pace I think. Concerns me though. Yeah, UConn's pace of play does. You think they're going to try to get out and run I a little think bit? They will. Or like they what? You think they'll try to get out and run? They always do. They're putting up 80 plus points a game. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if, and, and I don't know if, if it's in the 80s. I think it favors UConn. Yeah. Anything in the 70s or below, I think. I think we got us a, a hell of a game. I think if it gets into the 80s, I think it favors. Well, UConn. because what UConn is going to try to do is it basically off of a miss, they get the ball and they go. They want to get a shot in right. the first six seconds off of a miss, off of a make. They're taking it out of bounds. Tristan Newton's walking it up. He's getting over half court at 22 seconds. They're running all that stuff and they're trying to shoot with five seconds left. So if it's if it, Purdue's making shots, UConn is playing slow. Or often 25, 20 seconds, you have a five-second thought? I'm just so excited for this. Yeah. I'm so excited. I, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that we got this at the end of the year because we have wanted this all season long. We're thankful for all of you. We'll see you tomorrow at Huss Brewing from 4 to 7. A lot more to come. The Dream Championship game, UConn and Purdue, is set for Monday night. We'll preview it tomorrow.